this, you're back. Excited to be back, Rob. Your last interview kind of blew up quite quite a lot, and it, it suddenly dawned on everybody what the hell is going on with the metaverse. It was like one of the greatest interviews, I think, of Real Vision. So congrats on that one. But I really want to get you back. I mean, you and I have bumped into each other in Vegas, but I just want to get you back now to start talking about what else is going on, how the space has moved. But for people who didn't see the first interview, just give a bit of background about yourself. Yeah, sure. I guess a bit, bit of background uh, to recap is sort of like I got involved with uh, crypto reasonably early on um, through playing video games. One of those kids that was messing around with sort of gold farming and whatnot in a video game called RuneScape, which lots of people will be very familiar with. Um, ended up becoming pretty, uh, you know, in, engrossed with that whole world as I grew up. I'd say sort of from like 2016 onwards is when, um, you know, some of the more interesting applications around Ethereum and stuff started to really click with me. So long story short, sort of grew, grew up with crypto, always super immersed in it, always had a big love of sort of technology and computers and video games. Um, and that path kind of, yeah, took me towards um, ultimately sort of dropping out of my studies, doing computer science and philosophy and, uh jumping in at the deep end and, you know, trying to give, um, basically running some some sort of two private portfolios for my early investors, uh, run some money for them. And, you know, one thing led to the other and uh, ended up becoming, um, I ended up sort of co-founding the venture arm of a fund called Delphi Ventures, where I sort of helped um, cover the gaming and NFT side of things um, in recent years. And then, you know, for, for those that don't know, I, I guess there's enough familiarity on the Real Vision platform now with Delphi. So uh, so, so I'll leave that there. And yeah, then, just a bit. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then the the past year as well, I've also been working uh, with Bitcraft, sort of heading up the, the crypto efforts with, with Bitcraft, who are one of the first traditional game investors, originally sort of focused on esports, but expanded to gaming and interactive media more broadly. And now we're sort of largely investing in the synthetic reality thesis, the convergence of the physical and digital worlds that sort of spans everything from, you know, network latency infrastructure to in-game advertising engines to sort of volumetric video and all the way up to a brain computer interface company we did most recently. Um, but yeah, on the whole sort of super, immer uh, super um, immersed in the uh, intersection of crypto and gaming. And that's sort of, sort of what I spend most of my time on. When we last chatted uh, YGG just kind of started to become a thing. You guys were super early into that. Um, talk me through that journey a little bit, and then we'll open out into w all the stuff that you're looking at now. But because I just think that was a, a a really important moment in all of this, right? Absolutely. So Yield Guild was sort of the first um, project to really kind of, you know, formalize um, operations around one of these play to earn economies, notably Axie Infinity, of course, which sort of led this whole um, revolution, I guess, in gaming that really um, emphatically uh, demonstrated over the last year that, you know, blockchain gaming is here and it's likely here to stay. Um, you know, just to put some numbers on that, it kind of went from effectively, you know, maybe around 30,000 users at the start of last year up to, I think it ended at around 3 million um, sort of daily active users with that community. Um, they did $4.5 billion in transaction volume last year and made $1.3 billion of revenue, which is owned by a community treasury that basically everyone sort of has upside in that's around that economy, right? Um, as this game sort of scaled and there was demand for, you know, these scarce axes, um, basically the barriers to entry sort of increased, right? So a lot of the people in these economies wouldn't be able to afford the, you know, multi-hundred dollar up, up front cost to basically build a team to play in these games. And so Yield Guild was the first one to like basically formalize operations around this concept of, you know, scholarship programs, right? Whereby um, assets are lent out by the guild to players. They deploy them in these game economies and generate yields, um, a portion of which, you know, flows to the to the guild treasury, 20% of which goes to sort of like a scholar manager and 70% sticks with the original, you know, um, player that's actually using those assets in game. Um, and I think, yeah, raising sort of capital um, from the sort of investors that they did, um, obviously on, on the Delphi side, we were like super, super early there, sort of led their seed round. Um, we were then very proud to have led the, 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 the Air Series A with Bitcraft. Um, and then there were sort of successive rounds, you know, by Andreessen and then a public sale last year. I think, yeah, Yield Guild really represented sort of a, a tipping point in terms of showing people, you know, the direction of travel. I think um, since then we've seen, you know, many other guilds pop up across the space, all with the s similar objective of basically bootstrapping these like, you know, play to earn economies, um, deploying assets in them and, and figuring out how to generate yield from them, which is how a lot of these things are designed. Um, I think last year, if you include, um, you know, the IDOs, things like Merit Circle raised about $100 million, Guildfire, something similar. Um, I think there was over half a billion dollars raised for these, you know, play to earn gaming guilds last year, which gives you an indication of both professional and sort of retail investor appetite for where some of this stuff's going. Um, 
and yeah, I mean, uh, last year was in- incredible for you know a number of these projects. Um, Yield Guild, you know, is up at sort of well over ten thousand scholars um, that you know are now sort of working with them full time, operating across I don't know how many games at this point, but have been you know invested in some incredible games very early on. Already seen you know massive growth to the treasury and whatnot. Um, and yeah, I think they're in a really exciting position. So where do you think this kind of play to earn model is going to go? Because this is really the first manifestation of it. And it's rarely where it ends up. How how are you seeing what are people working on? Because you get a peek behind the curtain of the early stage of what else how people are thinking about this. Absolutely. I mean, I think the um, I think the play to earn aspect um, obviously has a long way to go. I think, um, you know, there's been some very um, potent sort of headwinds that have been exposed in, in you know, in, in, in the last 12 months, if you like, namely around sort of, um, you know, some of the sustainability of these economies, like what kind of sort of balances and levers we can pull to make sure that these things, you know, really can scale to where we want them to. Um, we've kind of entered like a whole new realm of responsibility, if you like, when you now have, you know, millions of people deriving either primary or partial income from a game, game economy, like we need to start thinking pretty seriously about that stuff. Um, I think the sort of regulatory aspect and whatnot has been a big one, figuring out how that's, you know, sort of reporting requirements and whatnot are going to interface with a lot of these things. Um, you know, distribution still a problem around app stores and things like that. All that aside, um, you know, I think we've seen this massive influx of talent that, you know, recognizes the opportunity here from the traditional game space. Um, couldn't be sort of more excited about what's going on there. I think this year we're having a number of these kind of like Gen 2 play to earn games coming to market, notably things like Alluvium, things like Guild of Guardians, things like Ember Sword, um, you know, that are basically sort of perhaps sort of well, not in not in every case, but um, some sort of more uh, traditional game developers, right, that have um, built and scaled games in the past where you know, in some respects, the kind of stepping up the complexity of the gameplay, um, you know, the sort of uh, graphical depth and things like that. Um, these are all super exciting. Uh, I think, you know, we, we, we're seeing a number of different sort of game genres start to be approached as well that are going to appeal to sort of a wider user base and whatnot. Um, and then there are other, I mean, there are some other, you know, um, other games coming to market in the more near term that are, you know, basically building off that framework that was built around Axie, but tailoring it to a sort of more specific use case. Things like uh, crypto unicorns from Laguna Games, I'm super excited about, which feels very on brand with uh, with where the crypto market's at. Um, but I think, yeah, on the play to earn side, uh, we're going to see, you know, a sort of increase in number, increase in sort of quality, the game teams coming in. Um, but I think, you know, fundamentally, the, the concept of it this is, is not going anywhere. I think there's been like a reframing as well um as a, a way from sort of play to earn more towards play and earn right and the, the the sort of sole motivator shouldn't be the profit motive here um people are starting to try and focus more on like yeah there's play play and earn component the idea that you should have some free to play uh you know version of the game is like the top of the funnel if you like um and that you know you can progress through these game economies and whatnot to a certain point before having to actually like you know enable you know buy an asset that enables you to participate in the economic side of things um so that's what we're kind of seeing on that front yeah i was swapping emails with mark cuban about this and he's really negative about a lot of this stuff because of what you alluded to before it's not clear whether how the economies can scale because right now they need new entrants and without new entrants it doesn't work how how are people approaching that thought process so yeah essentially um what, what's happening is uh you know in you, in, in each of these economies, you usually have, you know, sort of dual token system. You have one, which is AXS, the governance token, right, that I described, which um, essentially, you know, gives you voting rights on how that, you know, on-chain treasury that's accruing all of these fees gets allocated. And then you have SLP, which is the in-game currency that's the one you actually earn for performing different tasks, right, going out and battling your monsters or, or different types of um, different, different game modes and whatnot. But essentially, the issue becomes when um, there's too much of SLP being minted in the economy and not enough being burnt, right, which is what we're sort of seeing at the moment. There's this massive influx of players. Currently, the primary sinks in the economy um, have, you know, been the sort of uh, just the breeding process, right? Sort of breeding more axes. But the way people are approaching sort of uh, fixing this, they actually released a great post recently uh, in in terms of talking about other ways, other kind of sinks you can introduce to the economy, right? To sort of relieve some of that um, downward pressure from people farming out this token and selling it in the economy. 
things like um you know using basically having to burn axes in order to produce cosmetics for example to lever up you, you know that don't actually have any in-game effect but people might want to do for prestige or sort of like social status and things like that um the idea is basically that you can introduce these new mechanics you can introduce new types of gameplay um and you know effectively that nets out as uh, having sort of less of that downward pressure on that in, on that sort of native token for the game there's also something in this that it feels like it's going to move away from gaming as well in some respects where it's kind of feels like that these guilds or the DAO structure for sourcing different types of work where you can get work. I know balaji has been looking at some of this of like people can earn by doing tasks, but real life tasks for real businesses, for example, and then you can gain credibility points by the work you undertake where you earn higher amounts. feels like there's something really big in this that's outside of gaming but the gamification of of people's skills experience and time absolutely i think these um you know massive sort of worker collectives if you like uh are fascinating problems where people can basically start to um essentially drop like an on-chain bounty and say you know first person to solve x tasks in accordance with y criteria you know gets paid out maybe it's milestones based if it's a big engagement and not only that you know if you complete one five ten fifteen twenty of these and you do them well you start to build like almost an on-chain reputation within that worker collective and might be able to access you know higher quality tasks and things like that um for me, the one that is super exciting is still just in the context of these, you know, fascinating new game economies that are emerging. You know, to, to reiterate, like, like half a billion dollars raised for these play to earn gaming deals, um, you know, tens of thousands of players coming into them. Like, this is going to completely change the sort of audience um, developer relationship in gaming, right? We're starting to have um, these sort of collectives, these player collectives have way more sort of input um, in these game economies way earlier on than, than they sort of could before. I don't know. That's still the aspect of it that excites me a lot is the idea that, uh, you know, from doing something that is fun, um, people will be able to, uh, yeah, basically drive some income. Um, I definitely am, am, you know, curious to see how these things evolve in terms of that gamification and these game economies moving towards things that might be deemed to be like, you know, more useful? How can you gamify things that actually are, you know, a net good for society and make those enjoyable to do, profitable to do, and, you know, solving real problems? Um, I think that stuff becomes really cool. We've, we've had all the early, you know, uh, incarnations of um, people, for example, you know, sharing compute resources with like SETI from home, if you remember that, right, you can share some of your idle um, compute in order to help search for extraterrestrial life. Maybe we can, you know, start to move some of these economies uh, and some of these big collectives towards things, things like that, that are, that are pretty exciting. Hey, if you like this clip, be sure to check out the full interview and more only on realvision.com forward slash crypto. It's 100% free. Sign up now.